Listen up, beautiful people. I want to take just a minute to tell you about our new hosting site, Anchor. Anchor is your one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now, Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. So go to anchor.fm slash start and become part of the Anchor community today. And now, back to the show. Listen up, you beautiful, beautiful people. From the shadow of Graceland, it's the 901 Soccer Podcast. I'm Scotty Smith, and I will be your host. We love Memphis, and we love the game. That's what we like to talk about. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the 901 Soccer Podcast. We are a part of the Beautiful Game Network. Go to bgn.fm to discover soccer podcasts from across this great nation of ours. Okay, friends, let's talk for just a bit here about a new addition to the 901 FC family. The 29th overall signing and 28th member of this roster, Lagos Kunga. Lagos Kunga gives reason for excitement. Lagos Kunga was one of those names that kept popping up a couple of years ago as far as potential United States men's national team players. In fact, he played on the U-20 World Cup in 2017, and he scored a goal. He was on the actual roster. We have a U.S. U-20 international coming to Memphis. This is a pretty good deal. Now, along with Cam Lindley, who's a U-23 international Uh, Memphis has got a couple of players there that are being loaned to us from MLS teams that have uh, generated a lot of excitement over the last couple of years. Lagos Kunga is an interesting story. He was born in Angola. His family moved to Russia when he was a baby. Um, He spent about the first seven years of his life in Russia, moved to the United States of America, under refugee status, and gathered uh, with a lot of people in uh, that were also in refugee status in Georgia. Uh, there is a particular area of Georgia that is kind of known for for that. Um, went to high school in Tucker, Georgia. Went to a private school eventually uh, that was willing to work with him with tutors and those kinds of things because his U.S. Uh, youth national team schedule seemed to be uh, taking up a lot of his time. And they worked with him, and um, he got the attention of some folks in ODP, the Olympic Development Program. He joined that program and did rather well, representing Region 3 in that program. And uh, from there, he joined the Atlanta United Academy. Now, when Atlanta United, the MLS team, was not a thing yet, some of their podcasters would go and watch the youth team because the Atlanta United Academy was already playing around the South long before the MLS team. And so that was the thing to do. If you wanted to support Atlanta United, you would go watch one of the youth teams play. And Lagos Kunga was a name along with Andrew Carlton um, and George Bellow that got lots and lots of comments. You would hear those three names all the time. Lagos Kunga, Andrew Carlton, George Bellow. So Kunga seems to be, of those three, the one that is kind of maybe a little bit behind developmentally in comparison to the other two. He is now 20 years old and has not gained a lot of time with the first team. In fact, hasn't had a lot of time with the second team this year. And Carlos Bocanegra, in his statement, kind of made it sound like maybe a fresh start is needed, maybe a new city, maybe a change of scenery. He's never really played competitive soccer outside of Georgia. Maybe this is a fresh start. 
And I don't mean outside of Georgia, literally. I mean, he went to the U-20 World Cup. I think it was in Korea. But, you know, this is a guy who's kind of always been around home, you know, fairly close to home. Memphis could be a fresh start for him, something he can kind of get out on his own, sort of do his own thing, learn uh, what it's like to be a young adult in a, in a new city and, you know, be around a new group of guys, not guys that you grew up with, but, you know, a new group of guys and learn those dynamics. So we learned about the Kunga loan on Sunday night. I guess it was announced probably on Monday afternoon, and um, he was already in town at that time. So we are uh, excited to hear about that, and we're really, really looking forward to see Lagos Kunga on the pitch uh, on the pitch for Memphis 901 FC. If we had to take any uh, projections here, he will either wear number 11 or 29. I think 11 probably makes the most sense. So look for Lagos Kunga. He can play on the wing. And really, I've been saying for a while now that I don't know if, if 901 FC has any true wingers. Coach McQueen loves to build through the spine. There are a lot of number 10s. There are a lot of central midfielders, and there are a lot of forwards. But we're having to play central midfielders and forwards at wing. Lagos Kunga is going to technically be listed as a forward, but he is a left-footed player, and he has played on the left wing a lot. If he's on the left wing, that allows Muckett to play inside a little bit more. Maybe Muckett goes over to the right side. It's hard to tell. Uh, exactly what's going to happen. Maybe there's more of a diamond midfield. Maybe there's only one striker. Um, there are a lot of different formation uh, th- you know, possibilities by bringing in a guy who could play with his left foot and play over there. Speedy guy. He's got a lot of pace. Some of his highlights are he is phenomenal with the ball at his feet. He is exciting to watch. Everybody be on the lookout for Lagos. Kunga, this is really a big deal and a good loan signing for Memphis 901 FC. This is a name. This is a name. This name has been floating around for a little bit as a guy with a lot of potential, and we'd like for him to see that potential, raise his game, and uh, see the the realization of that potential in Memphis. All right, we're going to get to our game breakdown of a big win on Friday night against Hartford Athletic. Isaac Walker was kind enough to join us and talk about what he saw in that win over Hartford Athletic. I uh, want to remind you tomorrow night, nine oh or sorry, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, it would be tonight, 901 FC versus New York Red Bulls under 23s in the U.S. Open Cup. The U.S. Open Cup is a competition that is over 100 years old. It is the soccer tournament in all of America. It used to be all amateur teams. At various points throughout history, there have been professional leagues. We are now in another point in history with a professional league. I doubt we will ever be in in another point in history where there are no professional teams. So professional teams are the way of things. Um, Memphis City was never invited to the U.S. Open Cup. So this will be the first U.S. Open Cup match in Memphis in recorded history. Now... Somebody may listen to this and say, now, hold a second, the Rogues were in the U.S. Open Cup. Well, maybe. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find a record of that. Um, Maybe there was an amateur team that went to the U.S. Open Cup in 1904. You know, maybe. That's possible. I don't know. Uh, Well, I don't know if it was around in 04. In 1922. Maybe. Maybe. But this is the first known uh, U.S. Open Cup match in Memphis. So pretty excited about that. If... We win. Then the date for the next round of the U.S. Open Cup would be May the 29th, and that would be at uh, Micro Soccer Park. The thing about Micro Soccer Park is I have always wanted to see that. I love that stadium. Capacity of 2,500, but plenty of standing room. I have always wanted to see that capacity filled at Micro's. So we really need to win tomorrow night to make my dream come true. I want to see it. I want to see micros absolutely packed to the gills. I was hoping we would get there with Memphis City. We never did. But I want to see a packed out micros. But we we got to take it one game at a time. I understand that. we got to win this one first. 
and then move on uh, to the second round at Mike Rose. There is a conflict with the Redbirds on the 29th, and sometimes that's going to happen. Sometimes it's just going to be that way. Sometimes there will be conflicts with the Redbirds uh, playing in AutoZone Park, and there are unexpected open-cut matches that will have to be played at Mike Rose. That's fine. Mike Rose is a well-maintained stadium. It'll be fine. All right. Uh, That is about it for now. Like I said, we're going to get to uh, Isaac Walker and his post-game analysis of Memphis uh, 901 FC 2, Hartford Athletic 1. Okay, we are here with Isaac Walker. And uh, Isaac, I got a chance to go back, sit down, and review the match uh, this afternoon. We're recording here on Sunday night. Uh, I did get a chance to watch the game and uh, had some takeaways and I think a little bit of uh, reason for hope. It's always good to get three points. But what did you uh, what did you see uh, that was really positive for Memphis 901 FC? Um, I, I think the the biggest take – you could pick a lot of things, I guess, but the biggest thing is we held possession in their third of the field for a considerable amount of time. I think at halftime possession was maybe 65. Or was it something like that? It's 60-40, 65, 35, somewhere around in there. Um, so now granted, you know, Hartford is not a good team, right. but at the same time possession is possession, and you, you like them being able to keep that down in the final third. So. Yeah, and and also our you know shots. We seem to have a, a a lot of shots because their keeper had a very good night. Their uh, broadcast team named their keeper the man of the match, and even made the point that it could have been four or five to one. So, you know, getting those opportunities is a really good thing. So. I made the comment earlier. I was talking to Carl, Carl Schmidt of uh, Memphis FC and said, I thought we were playing at some points during this match a 4 2 2 2. What did you uh, see out of the formation? Um, I, this is something I've really struggled with. Usually I'm pretty good at picking out tactically what we're doing, but um, I, I felt like it was a 4 2 3 1. Um, I don't think Graf was very effective. And uh, on the contrary, I thought you, Collier was. And so what you saw was a lot of opportunity for Collier to get in there. And then because that possession was so uh, so much in their half of the field, I think you saw just people pushing forward. So, but I, th- I think by default it was probably a 4 2 three, one. So Graf is actually, uh, you know, he is a, uh, a guy that I think, I, to me, he looked more comfortable in this match than he did in Bur- against Birmingham. And he had a turn and rip in the first half that, man, it looked for all the world like a goal. Great save by the keeper, and Najum had a bad angle but tried to curl it into that post. Um, So that was most definitely an opportunity. But we did get a goal with – Muckett, as he sometimes does, kind of cheating into the mid, into the to the center of the pitch where he where he, you know actually played in Trinidad and Tobago, but Muhammad coming down that wing um, fed him the assist. Yeah, I, I think um, you know honestly, I thought Collier was going to get that first one, uh, but but Muckett had did a good job of kind of staying at the back of his zone at the top of the box and then coming in when he saw when the ball was going to. Um, uh, be available to them, but <clears throat> no, I, I I thought our midfielders and our our wingers in particular played really well, played really well. This week. And Muhammad, I, I, Muhammad has really kind of added something in the offensive end. And Hodge, man, Hodge has really impressed me. Two matches in a row now with the same back line. Because we've had a little bit of flux, we've had some, you know, trying to piece the t- piece together the right back line, and with Tristan Hodge moving into the center back role, he provides some athleticism that maybe we haven't seen there. And I thought he was getting out to balls and like I, intercepting some balls, doing a good job of reading some passes in the back, and so we might see that center back pairing of Birch and Hodge for a while. 
I, I think we probably will. And you're exactly right. You're going to win a lot more balls in the middle of the field because he's, you know, playing out on the outside. He's used to getting up the field, so he's going to anticipate more passes and pick them off. Um, I do wonder if when we play better teams, if that's going to hurt us inside our own box, uh, specifically in the air, or when they're getting number four and we have to put bodies on people. Uh, uh, we'll see how how that uh, how that goes but uh i think in general uh, the back line played really well with the exception of uh the goal they gave up and i don't know that you can definitely just pin it on them uh it was one of those moments we talked about that was not um it was not indicative of how the rest of the game went it's just one of those times where it looked like everyone said mm, someone else will get him and and he just kind of waltz right into the box so um no i, I think the wingers were flying up the field and and from everything we've seen on how 901 FC wants to play, that's how you want to play. You want your your midfielders controlling the ball. You want those uh, those wing backs getting up the field, getting dangerous. You want your uh, your your wingers up top to to be attacking the corners of the box. And you saw all of that last night. We had a great opportunity. I think our goal was actually in maybe the seven the seventieth minute, but then we had a great opportunity right before that with a very strong possibility with some good combination play and Najem with another no-look pass. Najem has played really, really well in these last few matches. It seems as though he may be lining up on the outside to start, but drifting in and coming in and just sort of kind of doing anything he wants to do. He's sort of bossed the midfield a little bit these last few matches. I, I think absolutely so, and I think a lot of that is probably – the fact that they're starting to kind of gel from a um, continuity perspective, they're getting used to each other. And once you have, you're accustomed to where people are going to be, what the system's like and, and everything like that, then it kind of opens up that creativity. And he obviously has that in spades. So, One great thing that Collier did on his goal was actually, you know, he's six foot, I don't know, seems like seven when you look at him compared to other people, but he's like six, four or five. And I thought, man, we've got to get him – especially on set pieces, we've got to get him up into places where he can use his height to sky over people and get his head on the ball. And even though this was a Sharpie cross, uh, he did exactly that. He got up, he got his head on the ball, the keeper had to make a save, and then while he was sort of laying on his side, he had that extra effort to, to you know, I think knock it in with his left foot. Um you know, so great effort on that second effort. But I really like the fact that he is in a position to use his height on some crosses. Yep, uh, and and it seems to be what we're going for. We seem to be heavy on the flanks. Even our combination play in the middle, typically the ball is being played out to the outside. So you're going to get a lot of in-swinging balls. You'd definitely like to see him find some space and 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 our wings see if we can pick him out and it seemed to seem to be uh it, you know he scored the goal that one time but it was there were multiple times during the game when that that seemed to be the plan of attack um I will say this on our shooting so you know you went for those first few games where we didn't get many opportunities to score uh to now we're getting you know substantially more um I, I think the next step for us is to maybe stop shooting right at the keeper it's uh, um, generally right. generally the plan. So, yeah. but I mean, as far as the progression goes, it's been really good. So, I, I expect our finishing to pick up in the in the back half of the season. Muckett's finish was calm. That's what I loved about it. He didn't overthink it. He didn't freak. He just like put the ball, you know, where the goalie wasn't. I mean, it was just really that simple. You know, the goalie's right in the middle of the goal. Let's just go. Let's go over here. Let's go to the left. So, um, you know, a good performance. It's good to to have a. A, a a three point ride home, I'm sure, and uh, you know we got two matches this week. We got the U.S. Open Cup on Wednesday night, and then we've got um, a big match with Pittsburgh on uh, Saturday night at home. The weather is supposed to be nice. It's not supposed to pick up raining again until next Sunday. So, man, we'd like to see absolutely everybody out at AutoZone Park and hopefully, you know, on a a little two-game winning streak. So uh, that would be – and I guess that would be a three-game unbeaten streak. So, you know, that would be nice to kind of put some of these things together, get out, get a good crowd out, and, uh, you know, really support our local team, as it were. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously you have uh, New York Rebels, too, coming in on Wednesday. They're top of the Eastern uh, table, so you're getting a good team there. And then um, 
Who, who, you say Pittsburgh I coming in this Pittsburgh, week? Yeah. Pittsburgh coming in. They're they're just ahead of us, so it's one of those you know chances where we can we can maybe leapfrog someone ahead of us in the, on the table. So both of these, um, we're expecting good weather. We're playing well. Everything you know points toward you know having a really good crowd. Yep. All right. So uh, so be prepared for that for these two matches this week and get out and uh, and and see your boys in blue.